Hello everyone, Dark of All Trades here. Now, if you're on my Discord, you've likely seen some people talking about their interactions with theists. This is something I encourage people to do and ask questions about their potential responses. We often talk about things like street epistemology. One of the goals of the Discord is to give a place for people to feel comfortable asking questions and also answering questions respectfully. As a teacher, I know that people I interact with are going to be at different levels of study on whatever topic we're talking about. Simply because I know something they don't doesn't mean it gives me any room to talk down to them. This especially goes for life as well. Even if I disagree with someone on a certain moral issue or a belief on the existence of some being, it doesn't mean I should treat them any differently. Maybe they have information I don't. I often see condescension coming from theists when there is a disagreement. Not that I don't see it coming from atheists, but based on my experience, it is less frequent. This could be a language issue. Perhaps changing the language slightly could help avoid some of the issues of coming off condescending. Unfortunately, when people get to the end of their linguistic capabilities, they run out of ways to express their position. Sometimes, whether due to frustration, lack of patience, or lack of empathy, they resort to belittling phrases like, I don't think you're mentally able to have this conversation. This leads me to a content creator called Darwin to Jesus. I don't know much about this person as I've only recently discovered his channel, but I've witnessed some interactions which prompted the previous, I'm not sure what you'd call that. It isn't quite a rant, and not arrogant enough to be a tirade. Perhaps a harangue? Maybe just a preamble. I'm not sure. Anyway, I want to give people the benefit of the doubt, so I thought I'd check out his channel. I found a few shorts which I could respond to where he goes on the attack, mostly against atheists. So let's see what Mr. DTJ has to DT say. Only The first short I'm checking out is called How to Be Correct. Well, I am often correct, though I'm not so arrogant to think that I can't be corrected. I'm here to learn, and I have my position on things evolve as I get new information. This is why I and many other atheists keep asking for evidence. We want to be correct. So let's see this well thought out short lecture on how to be correct. The only way to be correct about anything is to agree with God. To disagree with God is to be wrong by definition. Okay, that was much shorter than I anticipated. I was expecting something more than just agree with my version of a god. But as you may know, I take these videos seriously, as I don't know this content creator's level of education or experience with logic, epistemology, or even communication. So let me give this an honest try. Don't think I'm downplaying it. This statement is actually quite thought-provoking. At face value, it sounds like a definitive claim, one that leaves little room for disagreement. However, upon closer inspection, I see a few areas where he might need to reconsider the logic and implications of this perspective. First, I need to address the structure of this argument. It seems to rely on a form of circular reasoning, where the conclusion is assumed in the premise. Essentially, the statement argues that God is correct because God is correct. While this might hold within a specific belief system, it doesn't provide an external justification for why we should accept this premise in the first place. To those who don't share the same belief, it might appear that the argument is merely restating an assumption rather than proving it. Moreover, this claim seems somewhat arbitrary. By asserting that disagreeing with God is wrong by definition, it sets a standard without explaining why this standard should be accepted universally. In a world where different cultures and religions have varied understandings of God or gods, it's essential to question why one particular interpretation should be seen as the ultimate truth. This brings us to the subjectivity inherent in such claim. After all, different individuals and groups interpret religious teachings in diverse ways. If the statement is based on a specific interpretation of God's will, then it might be more accurate to say, agree with my interpretation or you're wrong, which could come across as a bit presumptuous. This leads to another concern, the implied authority in this statement. By asserting that agreement with God is the only path to correctness, it suggests that those who share this view might have privileged access to divine truth. While this might be a comforting belief, it can also come off as dismissive to others who might think differently but have equally sincere convictions. In fact, even within Christianity, there is a wide range of beliefs about what God wants or says. Claiming that any disagreement is inherently wrong overlooks the richness and diversity of these perspectives. It can also create unnecessary division, where a more inclusive approach might foster understanding and dialogue. While I can respect the strength of his convictions, 
I believe it's important to recognize the complexities and nuances in discussion about truth, especially when they involve deeply personal and varied interpretations of faith. A more open dialogue where different perspectives are considered and respected might lead us to a deeper understanding rather than a simple assertion of correctness. With that, let me see if I can lay out what he's trying to say in a stronger form. For those not familiar, this is called steel manning, the opposite of straw manning, where you take an argument and rather than attacking the weakest version of it, you strengthen the argument for the other person. I think it would look something like this. Premise 1. God is the ultimate source of truth and knowledge. Premise 2. Whatever God declares or wills is inherently true or correct. Premise 3. To be correct is to align one's belief with the ultimate source of truth. Conclusion, therefore to be correct about anything is to agree with God, and to disagree with God is to be wrong by definition. So what's good about this argument? The argument is internally consistent if one accepts the premises, especially the first premise that God is the ultimate source of truth. By defining correctness as alignment with ultimate truth, and God as the ultimate source of truth, the argument logically follows from the premises. The argument is well grounded within the theistic framework that assumes the existence and nature of God as described in many religious traditions. Let's go over the premises. The argument hinges on premise one, the belief that God, as something like an omniscient and omnipotent being, is the ultimate source of truth. This premise assumes that God's nature is perfectly good, just, and true, meaning that God's knowledge encompasses all truths. On to premise two, if God is the ultimate source of truth, then anything that God declares must be true, as God cannot be mistaken. This premise also assumes that human understanding is fallible and limited, so aligning with God's declarations is the surest way to access truth. Premise three defines the notion of correctness as aligning with truth. Since God is the ultimate source of truth, aligning one's belief with God's declarations or will is the definition of being correct. Following from these premises, if correctness is defined by alignment with the ultimate source of truth, in this case God, then any disagreement with God is inherently incorrect. Thus, to be correct is to agree with God, and to disagree is to be wrong by the very definition of truth as derived from God. This Steelman version assumes the truth of the premises from a theistic perspective and builds a logically consistent argument from those assumptions. However, the strength of the argument relies heavily on the acceptance of the initial premises, particularly the first one. However, if one accepts premise one, I do not think that they would not accept the rest of the argument. I am sure there's some niche case that could be made like the euthyphro but for knowledge rather than morality. If any theist out there accepts premise one but does not accept the argument, I'd like to know why. Of course, while the Steelman version of the argument is more logically coherent and internally consistent, it still suffers from the same core issues as the initial statement. These include circular reasoning, arbitrariness, subjective interpretation, implied authority, and a lack of external justification. These flaws severely hinders the argument's persuasiveness, especially with those who do not already accept premise one. Well, that was an adventure, wasn't it? I think we have time for another video. This one looks like a question video. It's titled, Why Do Atheists Only Criticize God and Not Satan? In my entire life as an atheist and now a Christian, I've never heard an atheist criticize Satan, only God. Why is that? I am not necessarily convinced that this guy ever was an atheist, but let's give him the benefit of the doubt. DTG, put yourself back into the mindset you had when you were an atheist. Try to answer this question as your former atheist self. What answer or answers did you come up with? Maybe if you struggle with this, I'm sure you could take time out of your busy day to politely ask one of those atheists you interact with this question. Or if you don't want to ask this directly to an atheist for whatever reason, if you check out the comment sections of this video, I'm sure some number of my of above average intelligence and attractiveness audience will leave a brief answer. Though let me grant his position entirely here, because it is actually kind of fun to think about. It's an interesting observation that atheists criticize God but don't criticize Satan, and I think there are several reasons for this. As an atheist, I don't believe in the existence of either God or Satan, so my criticisms aren't aimed at any real beings, but at the concept and the ideas that they represent within religious texts. But let me go over a few points to try to give a few other answers. As I said, atheists generally don't believe in the mythology itself, including the characters like God or Satan. Since we view these figures as fictional, criticizing Satan, who is often portrayed as the villain within the narrative, wouldn't serve much purpose in challenging the beliefs of those who do hold these stories as true. If someone doesn't believe the mythology is real, then they don't believe that the characters within those stories perform the actions attributed to them. Criticizing Satan would be like condemning Voldemort from Harry Potter. 
It might be interesting from a literary perspective, but it doesn't affect the reality we live in. Let's look at this from a practical standpoint. What would criticizing Satan accomplish in a conversation with a believer? If the goal is to engage in a meaningful discussion about religious beliefs, focusing on Satan, a figure already recognized as evil by believers, wouldn't be particularly effective. It's like demonizing a literal demon. You're not going to change anyone's mind by pointing out the flaws in a character they already consider to be the embodiment of evil. Believers likely already agree with most criticisms that atheists might bring up about Satan, so that discussion wouldn't really move the conversation about beliefs in the religion forward. Interestingly though, if we examine the stories themselves, Satan often plays the role that is more nuanced than simply being the bad guy. Take for instance the story of the Garden of Eden. If we assume that the serpent was indeed Satan, it is worth noting that he didn't actually lie to Adam and Eve. Instead, he pointed out a truth that God seemed to be concealing, that eating the fruit would give them knowledge of good and evil. In that sense, Satan could be seen as encouraging humanity to seek knowledge, while God was the one imposing a limit on their understanding. Then there's a matter of body count. Throughout the entire Bible, Satan is directly responsible for the deaths of only about 10 people, and those were killed with God's permission in the book of Job. On the other hand, God's actions in the Bible result in a much higher death toll. If we were to weigh these actions purely on the basis of harm caused, one might argue that God's actions are far more destructive than Satan's, at least according to the biblical narrative. Of course, this is a casual observation, but it does raise questions about how these figures are portrayed and what it means in a moral context. So the reason atheists tend to focus their criticisms on God rather than Satan is not because they see Satan as beyond reproach, but because the character of God is central to the belief system they're questioning. Criticizing Satan wouldn't challenge the foundational beliefs of Christians in the same way that questioning God's actions and motives might. And in some cases, Satan's role in the Bible is more complex and less straightforwardly evil than people often assume. For those reasons, discussions tend to focus more on the figure of God, where the implications for belief and morality are more significant. But let me turn this question around for a moment. Let's relate that to Christians and other religions. Tell me, DTJ, why don't you ever hear Christians criticize the jinn in Islam? After all, jinn are often perceived as mischievous or malevolent spirits, very similar to Satan in Christianity. More examples? You got it. In Norse mythology, Loki is a trickster god who causes a great deal of trouble for other gods, yet you rarely see Christians criticizing the god Loki, even though he plays a similar role to Satan's in causing chaos and deception. Why is that? In Hinduism, there are beings called Asuras, who are often in conflict with the Devas, gods, and they are sometimes associated with evil or disrupted forces. Yet Christians don't typically engage in discussions or criticisms of the Asuras, what makes Satan more worthy of critique than these figures from other religious traditions? In Zoroastrianism, Angra Menu or Ahriman is the destructive spirit, the embodiment of evil, much like Satan in Christianity. However, I don't often hear Christians criticizing Angra Menu. Why is the focus primarily on Satan? The reason for this might be similar to why atheists focus on God rather than Satan. People tend to engage with the central figures and concepts of their own belief systems. Just as Christians may not see a reason to criticize malevolent figures from other religions, atheists, especially those in Western societies, focus on questioning the deity at the core of Christianity, and that's where the most significant impact on belief lies. What do you think? Time for one more? Okay, let's check out one last one. Finally, since I apparently talk about morality so much, let's check out this one titled, Why Atheism Rejects Morality. Atheism fundamentally rejects the concept of objective morality. This stems from its denial of a universal mind responsible for all of reality. Without such a mind, atheism posits that there is no inherent reason or purpose to our existence. In the absence of a defined purpose, concepts of good and bad lose their meaning, as these terms inherently require a goal or end. Therefore, atheism logically leads to the rejection of objective morality by dismissing the very notion of purpose. Okay, he says a lot here, and I figured I'd let that play, rather than stopping every few seconds to address his points. So I'll organize and address them here. First, I'm going to take all of what he said here and put it into a more formal structure, so we can evaluate it without the superfluous wording. From what I can tell, the argument here is... Premise 1. Atheism rejects the existence of a universal mind responsible for all reality. Premise 2. Without a universal mind, there is no inherent reason or purpose to existence. Premise 3. Concepts of good and bad require a defined purpose or goal. Premise 4. Without a divine purpose, good and bad lose their meaning. 
Conclusion, therefore, atheism logically leads to the rejection of objective morality by dismissing the very notion of purpose. So what are the problems in this? I can appreciate the thought that went into this argument, but I think there are a few points worth examining more closely. Let's break down the reasoning here and see if it holds up under scrutiny. First, the argument relies on a false dichotomy, assuming that the only way to have objective morality is through belief in a universal mind. However, if we take away notions like divine purpose, objective morality can still be grounded in naturalistic principles, like reason, empathy, or societal well-being. This opens up the possibility of objective morality without needing to invoke any higher power. Second, there's a non-sequitur here. Just because atheism denies a universal mind doesn't mean it logically leads to the rejection of all forms of objective morality. Many atheists believe in objective moral standards based on secular ethics, human rights, or consequentialist principles. The conclusion that atheism must reject objective morality doesn't follow from the premises. Lastly, the argument commits the begging the question fallacy by assuming that a universal mind is necessary for purpose and morality, which is precisely the point under debate. We can't take that as given without further justification. In fact, I've made a video specifically addressing how objective morality can exist from an atheistic perspective. As I mentioned before, objective moral standards could be derived from the consequences of actions on human well-being. The idea that causing unnecessary harm is wrong could be an objective moral fact based on the inherent value of well-being. Another example could be the principle of fairness, which can be objectively determined through reason and reciprocity, concepts that don't require divine command. Now, while I personally lean towards moral subjectivity, that doesn't mean I believe that the terms good and bad lose their meaning. These concepts can still have significance based on shared human experiences, societal norms, or even just rational agreement. We might not have a universal divine purpose, but we can still find meaningful, consistent standards for evaluating moral actions. In short, while atheism may reject the idea of a universal mind, that doesn't inherently lead to the rejection of objective morality. Morality can be grounded in human nature, reason, and the consequences of our actions, rather than requiring a divine purpose. The discussion around objective morality is complex and requires a lot of nuance and understanding of said nuance and I believe it is possible to find common ground even without invoking a higher power. If we were to take something we both agree on, let's just say murder, for this case that's the unjust taking of a human life, under a religious moral system like divine command theory as the base, we could justify why murder is wrong by saying, because God says it is. This is a top-down moral system. Moral pronouncements are given from above, and those below do not have the right to question those pronouncements. I do have to point out that different religious traditions interpret and apply these commands in varying ways, which often lead to diverse understandings of morality within religious frameworks. Under an atheistic moral system, one can say murder is immoral because it is detrimental to the goal of overall human well-being. This is a lateral moral system, not only because it applies to everyone, but because anyone can question it and changes can be made if the case is presented well enough. Though again, I need to caveat this by saying that not all atheistic moral systems are entirely lateral. For example, some forms of moral realism argue that moral facts exist independently of human opinion and are discoverable through reason. So that's the end of his videos for today. But let's take a look at the points made by these three shorts. Now for your part. Do you have other thoughts on these that differ from what I said? Do you disagree with the position I took here? Did one of my responses really resonate with you? I'm interested in what you all have to say. That's it for this one, so what do you think? Do you think DTJ has made some fair criticisms? Do you think these attacks hit their mark? Or do you think he's stuck in his own worldview and that expressing empathy would resolve some of those issues? Let me know in the comments below. If you think that internal consistency of the video is apparent, show that by hitting the like button. And if you want another source of knowledge delivered directly to your YouTubes, hit that subscribe button if you haven't already to get a weekly supply. My Discord channel is slowly growing and I would love to see you there as well. A link to the invite is in the description. Of course, I have to give objective thanks to my patrons. Sora, Longhaired Lefty, Musical Ocelot, Ooga Booga Luga, Anonymous Netizen, Angel, Tarek Alkasab, Jammin Bomb, Kai Henningsen, and Triple Towel. But this week, I need to take a moment to thank Calamitous Anima for sending rank to the current highest level. You are a master of trades in my eyes. Thank you so much. On top of that, a few of you have been patrons for a year. Thank you so much for sticking with me and encouraging me to keep growing. If you would like to be correct about everything, irrespective of whether that coincides with the thoughts of a mythological character, you can join them for as low as a single dollar a month at patreon.com front slash dark of all trades.
Really, every one of you who donates, comments, shares, or just hits that like button, thank you for appreciating what I do here. It is a lot of work to juggle two to three other jobs and get original content up every week, but you all make it worth it. I suppose ultimately I would like to make this my work. I'd like to make an impact on people all over the world. I'm not shy at all and I have no issues with public speaking. I would love it if making content like this led to giving talks and meeting people, especially all of you. Thank you for your support. And as always, keep learning.